they were working with the fourth program in the series, and it's the sixth plate, plate number six, which is concerned with the alphabet chain, a very important exercise for you to practice, and an alphabet sentence. And I would suggest that every time you uncap the pen and uh, do a little of the arcade exercise, which you'll see later, that is moving with the rest, that you write an alphabet chain if you have time, and an alphabet sentence. And that way the alphabet will remain fresh for you. Now let's look at the textbook at plate six. <coughs> Last time we, uh, I covered some of the points which are on this plate. For instance, the crossbar on the F. And you start it with the pen, the cor right corner of the pen touching the stem, and the pen is underneath the waistline, and you pull to the right. With the T, you begin with the pen under the waistline, at a, the edge of the 45 degree angle, and sidle up until the pen's edge is above the waistline, but the left corner touching the waistline. Then you pull down, then you go back to the original position, and with the pen, you write the crossbar under, just underneath the waistline, the top of the crossbar touching the waistline. The T, like the T, begins with a saddle stroke, a pen width below the waistline, a pen width above the waistline, and you pull down. The J is not like the beginning of the T, however. The point just protrudes through the waistline. You don't go up a full pen width. So let's begin with the two Fs. When two Fs come together, or an F and a T, or two Ts, they have the one crossbar in common. We we'll start with a little move to the right to get the H going. Think a full curve. Don't make that curve an angle. Touch the stem just under the waistline and pull this over. That's for a single half. Now, when two Fs come together, start the first one low, a little lower than usual. Then immediately start the second one up at the ascender line, swing over, touch that top stroke, then come down and join the hairline here just above the descender line. Then touch the stem with the right corner and give them a common bar. If you're joining into an eye, you will come out. Uh, you can join out of the F, as you will see later, out of the crossbar, and uh, you can join out of the T this way. The crossbars make legitimate horizontal joins. Now, the S is a tricky letter. Some beginners find it very difficult. I'll make a large S, say the size of a calf S. Think of it as being two circles, a small circle, on top of a slightly larger circle. Now, we don't need the certain parts of that for the S, so let's cut them out. We don't need this part in here. We don't need this part in here. But that wouldn't make a very good S, you can see. Because this droops, and this seems to have a broken back, and this swings up. The whole thing is just too twisty. It's too much like a pretzel to be an S. So <coughs> we need to do three things. Lower this top arm, straighten the spine, and then or raise the top arm, straighten the spine, and lower the bottom arm. Let's see what happens when we raise that upper arm. Get a full curve, slightly smaller than the one below, straighten the spine, and then a slightly larger curve beneath with the lower arm, lowered somewhat. Now that makes a good S, a rather graceful one. Let's do it again. Lifting the upper arm, straightening the spine, lowering the bottom arm. I would train my hand if I were you to lift that to straighten this and to lower this. But when you write an S, think small full curve over a slightly larger full curve. That will make a good letter for you. One of the things to avoid right off is getting a backward Z with angles here and angles here. This is not 
a good S. It's just too sharp, too zigzaggy. So lift that arm up, just full curve, straight body, just flat, larger full curve, and lower the bottom arm. Well, I wish you luck with the S. Now the V begins with a very sweet stroke. And I wish you'd think always with V, W, X, and Y, down steep and then way over. Some students have difficulty making this letter slope. To check the slope of it, find the midpoint in here and then connect it with the point of the counter. Now that is the letter slope. So if you had an I here, the I would be parallel to that line, which you can imagine being there. With W, you make slightly smaller counters, narrower counters than those of these. You can do it with rapid handwriting in one stroke. And again, imagine a line that's in the midpoint touching the point of the counter. That is the letter slope. And then I coming after it should be parallel with that. The X down steep again way over for the second stroke, cross above center. Then again, you can join the midpoint with the counter point and then you continue it down below. That again is the letter slope. The Y also down steep, way over. And this is the letter slope. You see. The V it shouldn't be made awfully stiff and mechanical. Try to avoid making these absolutely horizontal. You can put a little sweetening in it with a slight reverse curve, a very slight one, but whatever you do, don't overdo it like this, because that just ruins the letter altogether. You just get too much. This Z with a perfectly horizontal beginning, diagonal, perfectly horizontal end, that looks quarrelsome. It's bearing its teeth. And we need to sweeten it a little bit, make it look a little less self-righteous with a slight reverse curve, slight reverse curve here. Now, this, these parts should uh, represent the letter slope. Not so much here as here. It's the beginning of letters that we judge when we're looking for letter slopes. That is, this should be parallel to that stroke on A. We're writing those V and A together. <coughs> you have the alternate T, which I mentioned last time, which comes up above the line. You tuck that stem and put the crossbar below the waistline. Now, according to the book, you have to write this with a B3 pen. Now, let's glance at the uh, text again. At the, the top line is written with a B3 and I suggest you take the B3 guidelines from the back of the book and fold the paper over them as I showed you before. This is written with a B2 nib, that is the lines below are written with a B2, so use the B2 guidelines and fold the paper over and uh, write the alphabet chain. Now, why all those ends? N is one of the most difficult letters to write, and we do this in order to learn to write a good N and to practice it and perfect it. If any other letter causes you difficulty, you, in place of N, you could use a, a B or any other letter in the alphabet, a Y or an S, S, A, S, B, C, S, D, S, and so on, clear through the alphabet, ending with uh, the S, the Z, S. This uh, will keep your hands in with all the letters of the alphabet. And a good way to learn to write an N is to not to write 10 Ns, not to write more than three. But when you write an N and it doesn't come out right, try it again. If it doesn't come out right, try it a third time. But then try another letter. Don't just repeat the end. They'll get worse and worse. But you need to wash the bad after end of the bad end out of your hand. And lye soap won't wash out that bad after end. The only way to wash it out would be to write another letter. And one of the best ways is to use a letter that has a contrary motion to that of N. N is clockwise. So write a U, which is counterclockwise. 
and you and you and you. And you'll find that the ends get better and the you's will get better as you go ahead. But rope practice is rather dense. It's all right, I suppose, for retards or for delinquents, but uh, you're neither. And uh, use the time wisely. Practice with patience and practice critically. Uh, uh, put the pen down and find out what's wrong if something seems to be wrong with your letters. Now, following that, we have an alphabet sentence. An alphabet sentence uses all of the letters in the alphabet, and uh, that's a good way to practice, especially when you uncap the pen, try to miss that, and, and go through the full alphabet, and uh, you may find that the alphabet sentence is far more interesting than an alphabet chain with the end of an alternate length or some other letter. And, uh, it's a little quicker. This uh, uh, particular alphabet sentence is a favorite one with printers and with uh, calligraphers. So the, become acquainted with a quick brown fox. He is our, our totem and one of our friends. Let's look at the X, which is at the end. We put the quotation marks before and after it. Now, Everybody has difficulty remembering how quotation marks are made because they look like little tadpoles, but do they bend toward the left? Do they bend toward the right? Are their heads up or are their heads down? Well, the pen will remember if you don't. Make little double parentheses, you see, like this, with the pen's edge up at a 45-degree angle, and the pen has designed these things for you. Uh, your pen knows or you can always just ask the pen about how quotation marks go by making these little double parentheses in the design that's done for you. And after a word, say the word ends with the letter N, you want to put in a comma. Well, allow just a little bit of space here between the parent line after the N and the punctuation mark. The same way with a semicolon. Use a little lozenge and then you turn the pen, keeping the, the edge angle the same to make that little curve. Start the semicolon uh, about halfway between the routing line and the waistline, and then add the comma. The semicolon should be the two lozenges and a period. Put down so that the lozenge seems to be a bead strung on the routing line as the string for the bead. <coughs> the uh, question mark is uh, just cap height. So here is the cap G. Here is the word ending with that. Here is the extender line. Here is the waistline. Here is the routing line. The cap go up halfway between the uh, waistline and the ascender line. Don't make the question mark the same height. Practice this. Be sure you get it wide enough. It's a very graceful flex. I'm going to talk later about the origin of that uh, in another series. The exclamation point, called the panic box, sometimes by printers, is that. And it is just the height of the, um, of the question mark and of the capital. The uh, quotations are a little bit lower. Of course, the apostrophe would be written the same way. <coughs> but be patient with yourself, patient with the tools, but especially with yourself, and practice slowly. Don't hurry the pen writing, because you can scribble at the beginning and it's probably not very wise to scribble later on. You go too fast. If you want speed, use electronic tape or use a typewriter. Uh, use some other way of communicating. But you have time now with the various other ways of communicating, your telephone, electronic tape, and electric typewriter. So if you write at all, you have time to write carefully. And give you, it gives you pleasure if the pen moves smoothly and beautifully, and it gives your reader pleasure. 
on one sign I've left out, and it's there. It's the ampersand. It's A M P E R S A N D. Now, when children used to recite the alphabet years ago, they end with X Y Z. We call it Z today. X Y Z and per se and. Per se means by itself. So you'd have Z and, and by itself and. This is the slow one that you can use in your handwriting. It's uh, Latin ET or and. It can be a very beautiful design. In my own handwriting, I prefer a very quick one which is written this way an ET. The uh, one common in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance is written this way. But that's only part of it. It was completed with a circular part here. Sometimes that was left open. Like this. Now you see this looks like the E here and the cross part of the T is omitted. <coughs> One of the most common ampersands, and you see it on buildings, you see it in advertising, is this form. There are thousands of ampersands, just literally thousands of them. And these are the most common, most common designs. You see, this one suggests a, a, a E here, like this, the epsilon in Greek. So if that could be seen in here, too. But this design, suppose you started up here not finishing with that, but beginning right in here, and then came down with this diagonal, and brought this through and connected it to that. See, that gives you this ampersand, which you see very often, as I said, on signs at the present time. Practice these ampersands, they're, they're a lot of fun to do. A one is very common. Is this. I don't care much for it, but I think the, the, the nicest one is that. It may not take up that much room, but it's nice to be able to swing it out and maybe finish a line with it. You don't uh, use it very often, but uh, I like to use it whenever I can, if the copy will permit it. If I'm doing work for a client, if the client doesn't mind that sign for hand, the Latin E T. Well, let's write the advice for this lesson. The Japanese poet Aper wrote a lovely haiku for a snail. He said, So you're going to climb Mount Fuji? Slowly, snail, slowly. So we're all snails. And we're learning something. So we need to go like this now. And we'll get there. Remember the tale of Aesop, the red hair on the tortoise, and the tortoise winning the race. By persistence, we will get there. So, sometime or other, we'll get to the top of Mount Fuji. Fujiyama is the Japanese name, and Yama. In Japanese is mountain, so don't say Mount Fujiyama, it's just Mount Fuji or Fujiyama. That's our goal. That's where we go. That's where we're headed for when we take up the art of calligraphy or fine writing. <coughs> Lazy is probably the most difficult word in the list of words that you have, so let me write it for you. Again, to avoid a big hole here, let's start the Y right under the 
Help the right hand corner of the knee. Don't make that too wide. It's very easy to go over too far. But this can be too flat, too, when you come up here. And it looks like a yawning crocodile to swallow a poor car or truck. So come down and keep go way over. And then the line that fell with nothing else in the alphabet. <coughs> allowing a little space between the punctuation mark and the last letter. Critical practice is what will get you going and keep you going. You'll go much faster if you go slowly. You stop and try to find out what, if anything, is wrong with your writing, and then immediately correct it. It may be pen angle, it may be slope, it may be construction. You may not have allowed the proper uh, shape of counter inside a letter. You may not have the proper shape external triangular counters. So watch those triangular counters and whenever they appear, uh, compare them with other counters. The one on R is bound to be considerably narrower because uh, the letter has to be made narrow. So we come up rather close to the stem. So that probably is an exceptional exterior triangular counter. Now occasionally during this series, and I want you to visit particular classrooms with me. And at this session, we're going to go to the advanced calligraphy class at the Museum Art School. It's a class that I have there and I've had for many years on um, Thursday night. Um, they're begin this is just at the beginning of the class, and they're working, most of them, with the arcade. That is a series of M strokes, and the idea is to warm up the wrist action. And you'll see that they're using wrists and not many are using their fingers. You watch the fingers here. You notice that the fingers are not moving on the joints, but the whole hand is moving on the wrist. This is what makes it handwriting. I spoke of that the first uh, session, and I want you to practice writing, waggling your hand back and forth on the wrist. When you write with wrist action, you aren't likely to get any uh, writer's cramp. And writer's cramp can ruin everything for you. You see the whole hand is waggling along. It's difficult at first to do this. We do it rather rapidly in order to keep the, the finger movement from getting into the act. The fingers want very much to get into the act. But the fact is, the whole hand seems to be moving on the wrist. This girl writes a very beautiful formal hand. You notice the wrist movement. Here you find some nice wrist movement. It may be done a little fast. It's dangerous if you speed up too much. But there's wrist action. And the wrist action can be used with large writing. Now here, the uh, terminals are getting a little swacky. This is a swacky stroke there. There's a very bad stroke. Not enough wrist action. If the wrist action had been there, that would have been elliptical. 
And that's what we try to get. So back to the arcade with M's and M's and H with M's and M's. And see if you can do it with wrist action alone. Well, keep your pens wet and we'll see you next time.